I have some sad news. My dad passed away last night due to complications from surgery. He is now with my mom and Jesus. Please pray for peace and comfort for my family during this difficult time. God bless you guys. The Watchman. Welcome to The Watchman channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963. Thank you all so much for your prayers and support. God bless. Biden's new rule for homeowners that's going to affect tomorrow is all about equity. We need to make equity and justice part of what we do every day. The Biden-Harris administration has made racial equity a centerpiece of our economic agenda. Please do work with us to put equity at the center of our collective response. He stood to run on equity and inclusion, and he has shown that throughout his administration. So these are investments that are going to be to the benefit of U.S. economic strength writ large, as well as representing a measure of justice and equity to communities that have been harmed. Well, the new rule will require first-time home buyers with good credit to pay more a month than those with poor credit. Makes sense. So why is the Biden administration punishing people who pay their bills? Equity, of course. We're rewarding people who are not being responsible in terms of their budgeting in their households. And let's take a look, by the way, at the new mortgage fee structure. This is interesting. If you have a 620 FICO score, that's like a fair score, you get a 1.75% fee discount. But if you're at 740, which is a very good FICO score, then you're paying a 1% fee. Usually, when you go and get a loan from a bank, you go and get health insurance, the higher the risk you are, the higher the potential fees and the interest rate's going to be because you are risky and that's the way it should be. What this is doing is taking us more towards socialism and that works for many countries. The United States has always rejected that and this will be something that should be weighed heavily in the ballots because they are trying to take us in their talk of equity to a more socialistic state. Absolutely. This is socialism for homeowners. This Biden administration more and more often they are making decisions to reward bad decisions. And that's not the way you grow as a country, as an economy. Essentially saying, hey, if you spent recklessly, you lived above your means, and you stopped making your payments on time, have no fear. Someone who's done it the right way is going to pay for you. Was socialism taught in the Bible? Acts 4, 32 through 35. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all, nor was there anyone among them who lacked. For all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them, and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold, and laid them at the apostles' feet, and he distributed to each as anyone had need. Socialists, among whom are a growing number of Christians, seek to influence public policy so that society will become less capitalistic and more socialistic, and they see this as a means to live out the biblical passages just mentioned in Acts 4. However, none of the passages mentioned in Acts call for a socialist society or mandates a redistribution of wealth. The New Testament does not call for the church to embrace socialism within the church, much less in society at large. The donations given in Acts 4 were completely voluntary. The early church demonstrated a pattern of generous giving as the Lord had blessed individuals and as he led them to give to help the poor. There is no mandated redistribution of wealth, and the example of the Jerusalem church was not meant to be taken as a model for national governments. In the book of Acts, the followers of Jesus gave to one another as anyone had need. But was this socialism? No. The key difference is the disciples gave away their possessions freely and a socialist government owns and distributes property as they see fit. Jesus confronted the money changers and challenged believers to give to the needy. But would he support socialism? Increasingly, Americans think he would. In a recent Barna poll, 43% of Americans say socialism would be a good thing for the country. 51% believe socialism would be a bad thing for the country. The poll reveals a disturbing trend, and here's why. 
Socialism punishes virtue. Socialists want to distribute wealth to individuals according to their need, regardless of virtue. Socialism runs the risk of removing God-designed rewards and consequences. It can punish those who are hardworking by making them pay for those who are not. And it can reward those who aren't hardworking by giving them the fruits of another man's labor. The Bible teaches that anyone who refuses to work should be denied food, as we read in 2 Thessalonians 3.10. For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, If anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. Socialism seeks to destroy marriage and family. What socialism seeks is for the government to replace the family. That way, it can indoctrinate children in its leftist way of thinking and remove them from any notions of God and religion. Leftists are proud supporters of gay marriage and abortion. There's nothing Christian about socialism. And there's absolutely no way Jesus would ever support it. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. As a sign of his coming and the end of the age, Jesus declares, And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For a nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Russian forces attack several cities with drones overnight. Russia says these strikes are retaliation for an alleged drone attack on the Kremlin yesterday. Now, Moscow claims the target was President Vladimir Putin. And this morning, a top Russian official accused the U.S. of planning it. Charlie Daggett is in Dnipro, Ukraine, with more on this part of the story. That accusation came from uh, Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov saying attempts to disown this from Kiev in Washington are absolutely ridiculous. Those are his words. We know very well decisions on such attacks are made not in Kiev, but Washington. Kiev is just doing what it's told. Russia had vowed retaliation for this alleged double drone strike, something the Kremlin called a terrorist act and an attempt on the life of President Putin without offering any evidence to back up the claims. But overnight, the Russian military unleashed a wave of drones toward Ukraine. With Ukrainian air defense officials saying they destroyed 18 of 24 drones, including every single one headed toward Kyiv. The third time the capital has been targeted in four days. Ukraine said it had nothing to do with the alleged Kremlin attack, accusing Russia of staging the whole thing. The Ukrainian president putting the blame firmly at the feet of Putin. It's all really simple, he said. Russia has no victories. He can't send his soldiers into death anymore. He can't motivate his country anymore. Now he needs to find any possibility to motivate them. Even before the Russian announcement, the southern city of Kherson bore the brunt of the payback. Officials say Russian shelling killed 21 civilians and wounded dozens more, hitting a supermarket, train crossing, and residential homes. In an ominous sign of more trouble ahead, a curfew has been declared for Kherson City through the weekend. Now, some voices in Moscow are now calling for the direct targeting of President Zelensky himself. One general saying Kyiv has crossed another red line, predicting a strike on Ukraine's presidential palace in retaliation. After a day-long flare-up, Israel and Gaza terror groups agreed to a ceasefire this morning. The terrorists fired over 100 rockets and mortars towards Israel in the 24-hour period. And I have to be Steve Leibovich has the story. The latest round of clashes between Israel and Gaza terror groups began shortly after the announced death of Islamic Jihad's Khader Adnan in prison after an 86-day hunger strike. At first, four rockets were fired from Gaza, causing no injuries. In response, IDF tanks struck a Hamas observation post near the border. The terrorists renewed fire, and a rocket hit a construction site in Sterot, 
seriously wounding a 25-year-old foreign national and lightly wounding two others. In the evening hours, Gaza terrorists fired dozens of rockets and mortar shells into Israel. Most were intercepted by the Iron Dome air defense system, landed in open areas, or fell short and landed inside Gaza. Five hit urban areas in southern Israel. Overnight, the Air Force responded forcefully, carrying out airstrikes against terrorist targets, hitting a Hamas training camp, a concrete production plant, and a tunnel used by Hamas in southern Gaza. Explosions were heard across northern and central Gaza. The army said the strikes deal a serious blow to Hamas's ability to fortify and arm itself. The two sides reportedly agreed to a truce before dawn. According to foreign reports, the agreement was mediated by officials from Egypt, Qatar, and the United Nations. The truce was apparently broken briefly when the warning system went off in the community of Nir Am, but was quickly restored. Early this morning, the army said that after a situational assessment, it had decided that those living in communities bordering the Strip could return to their usual routines. Israel and Gaza terror groups have repeatedly waged brief, back-and-forth battles across the border in recent years. The exchanges vary in duration and intensity. There have also been more severe and longer conflicts, including the last in 2021, when Israel launched Operation Guardian of the Walls. The Bible tells us there are four possible prophecies on the verge of finding fulfillment. Isaiah 17.1, in which Damascus, Syria will be destroyed in a single night. Jeremiah 49, the prophecy of Alam, which could infer an Israeli attack upon Iran's nuclear program. Psalm 83, in which the Muslim nations that border Israel will mount an attack on Israel in order to cut them off from being a nation. Ezekiel 38 and 39, known as the War of Gog and Magog. In this prophecy, a coalition of nations led by Russia, Iran, and Turkey will attack Israel in the last days in order to take Israel's wealth. This video purports to show fighters from the paramilitary rapid support forces at the presidential palace in Khartoum. It's the office of the head of the army, General Abdel Fattah al-Burhan, but the RSF says it's in control of this government building. There's been more intense fighting in the capital as the two sides battle for control. That's despite the announcement of an extension of a ceasefire for one week after mediation efforts by South Sudan's president, Salva Kiir. Looting is still a problem. In Bakri, in the northern part of Khartoum, thieves have stolen clothes and textiles from every store at this market. The UN says the deteriorating situation is making it difficult to deliver aid. Its humanitarian chief, who visited Port Sudan, says security guarantees are needed. The fighting and instability is pushing more families to flee the capital. This bus of evacuees is heading north to the eastern Red Sea coast. Along the way, they pass through several checkpoints. Some are controlled by the army, others by the rapid support forces. People coming from Khartoum who are escaping the war and trying to find safety and security arrive here under very difficult circumstances. Some people who have passed through here don't have food. Some are sick. Some are very old. In Port Sudan, Navy ships, commercial ferries and airplanes are shuttling people out of the country. Authorities say around 13,000 foreign nationals have left in recent weeks. But more evacuees arrive each day and the city is struggling to cope. Luke 21:25, And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. One of the many signs we are living in the last days right before the return of Jesus Christ is nations will be in a state of perplexity or uncertainty over what to do in a difficult situation. This is exactly what is happening in our world today. Jesus, speaking to his disciples about the signs of his coming and the end of the age, declares this in Matthew 24, 12. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. The Bible tells us lawlessness is the violation of God's commandments, as we read in 1 John 3, 4. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Sin will be so rampant and so commonplace in the last days that the love people once had for one another, for many, will be non-existent. In this prophecy, Jesus Christ is describing an ongoing breakdown in the relationship with God. And since people's love for God is waning, it will be evident in the way people treat one another as well. A symptom may be that the love toward other people is decreasing, but the real cause is that the relationship with God is cooling off. 
This is what we are witnessing in our world today. A deadly shooting at an elementary school in the capital of Serbia. The suspect is a teenage boy, NBC's chief foreign correspondent Richard Engels, following that story for us, just breaking now. Hey, Richard, what can you tell us? So a terrible development this happening in Belgrade, Serbia, an elementary and middle school. Uh, and according to witnesses, police reports, uh, families, they say that a student at the school, 14 years old, uh, just after 8.30 in the morning as uh, school was getting underway, he entered the school, had his father's handgun, killed a security guard, shot his teacher, who is in uh, critical condition, and then, according to local media, started opening fire in his classroom, killing eight students, some of them reported to be his friends. Now, mass shootings outside the United States are extremely rare. School shootings, even more rare. There hadn't been a, a school shooting, or hadn't been a mass shooting in, in, in Belgrade in over a decade. Witnesses describe a very chaotic scene as parents rushed to the school to try and uh, find their children, even as the gunshots were still ringing out. In Pakistan, at least eight teachers have been shot dead at a school. The attack happened during an exam period in Kuram district in the northwest. Police are investigating the motive behind the killings. Let's bring in Kamal Haider, who's in Islamabad Forest. Kamal, what more are you hearing about the circumstances of this attack? Well, first of all, as you mentioned, the incident took place in Kuram district. This is very close to the Afghan border. Uh, this is also an area which has seen in the past uh, sectarian violence between Shia and Sunni tribes in the area. This particular attack uh, targeted uh, the teachers while they were in the staff room, seven of them. Mysterious circumstances because not many people were able to see what transpired there, how many attackers were involved, what was the motive. Another teacher, and that would be the eighth teacher, was gunned down not far away from that location as he was traveling in a vehicle. So indeed, a gruesome incident. Well, we begin this morning with another another deadly mass shooting in America, this time in Atlanta. One person was killed and four more were hospitalized after a gunman opened fire yesterday in a waiting room of a medical office. The suspect was eventually arrested after an hours-long manhunt involving local, state, and federal law enforcement. The woman who was killed was a CDC employee named Amy St. Pierre. Mm -hmm. She was just 39 years old. This community mourning the death, the murder of Amy St. Pierre, killed in the latest math shooting here in Atlanta. Thousands of people yesterday running for cover, for shelter, as police search for an armed gunman. We have a national epidemic on gun violence in America. That was Atlanta Mayor Andre Dickens. Shortly after 24-year-old shooting suspect Dion Patterson was arrested in neighboring Cobb County Wednesday. It was around eight hours earlier that the first 911 calls came in. Female shot. She's seriously bleeding. A law enforcement source told CBS News that Patterson a Coast Guard veteran was in a waiting room in the Northside Hospital medical facility when he became agitated, taking out a handgun, opening fire, fleeing the scene, and police say carjacking a pickup truck from a nearby gas station. We didn't know what the poppy noise was, so originally we just ignored it. KJ Johnson was two floors below the shooter when gunfire rang out and said that he didn't realize what was happening until the breaking news appeared on TV. The medical staff did a great job. They found a secure area in the back of the facility where we were on the ninth floor. All five victims were women. One CDC employee, Amy St. Pierre, died. Authorities say the other four were hospitalized. Why he did what he did, all that is still under investigation. Though police would not comment on the suspect's potential motive, a law enforcement source told us that his mother, who accompanied her son to the appointment, said that he was on medication for mental health issues. The mother is cooperating with police. Can you feel it? Can you sense it? Something is changing in our world. Second Timothy 3, 1 through 5. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away.
One of the many signs that we are living in the last days is that men would be lovers of themselves, as we read in 2 Timothy 3, 1-5. Every characteristic listed after men would be lovers of themselves illustrates what men do when they love themselves above God. When you jump down to verse 13, the Bible states, But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. It is very evident that evil is getting worse and deception is off the charts. Godlessness is now taking over all aspects of society. To the California College campus on edge this morning, following three stabbings that left two people dead, including a student, and police say the attacks could be linked. Since Thursday, there has been a stabbing every other night. One UC Davis student had just won an award at a ceremony and was walking home when he was stabbed and killed. This morning, police are trying to figure out who is responsible for this stabbing spree and why. This morning, an urgent manhunt is underway after three people were stabbed in a Northern California college town, leaving two dead and one in the ICU. This is different, um, and uh, the attacks were particularly violent and brazen. The three separate stabbings all occurring at night in Davis, just west of Sacramento. We're not getting information that somebody possibly stabbed. The latest attack happening Monday night. A woman calling 911 telling authorities she'd been stabbed multiple times through her tent. She was hospitalized in critical condition. The FBI now assisting police trying to determine if the crimes are linked. The suspect in each described as a college-aged man with curly hair. 20-year-old UC Davis student Kareem Abu Najam attacked in Sycamore Park Saturday night. We have a medical doctor who found this male subject who was gasping for air and he's bleeding on his entire body. His father, a professor at the school, saying they regularly took the path he was found on. Kareem has gone. We were just, you know, doing his funeral arrangements rather than preparing for his graduation party. His death coming on the heels of David Bros, a beloved community member who was homeless. The campus of UC Davis on edge. We have beefed up police presence. People are anxious and fearful, and rightfully so. In this country, a man accused of shooting five of his neighbors, including a young boy, is now behind bars. Francisco Oropesa was found less than 20 miles from where the shooting occurred. He was hiding under a pile of laundry when police got him. Officials say a call to a tip line led them to him, and that several other arrests have now been made. This is the moment Francisco Oropesa was led away in handcuffs, ending a nationwide manhunt. Authorities say a call to an FBI tip line led them to a home in the nearby town of Cut and Shoot, Texas. U.S. Marshals, FBI, we had a tag team. They all meandered over there and uh, found, found that, that tip to be true. The arrest happened about 16 miles from Cleveland, Texas, where the 38-year-old is accused of going to his neighbor's home and killing five people with an AR-style rifle Friday night before fleeing on the run for the last four days. He was caught hiding in a closet underneath some laundry. They effectively made the arrest. He is uninjured. Bottom line is, we now have this man in custody. Authorities say the incident happened after the suspect's neighbor asked him to stop shooting his gun in his yard because a baby was sleeping. Wilson Garcia's wife and nine-year-old son were killed. The boy was the youngest of the victims, all from Honduras. Officials say they hope the arrest will give closure to their loved ones. I hope that this will bring them some comfort um, and they could grieve. One of the many signs that we are living in the end times is the epidemic of wickedness and violence that is sweeping the world today. Jesus tells us when society parallels the days of Noah, he will return as we read in Matthew 24, 37-39. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. So what was going on in Noah's day that parallels our day? To find out the answer, we need to go back to the book of Genesis 6, 5-13. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. 
This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God, and Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. There is no doubt about the hour in which we live being the season for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ as we link Matthew 24 verses 12 and 37 through 39 with 2 Timothy 3 1 through 5. The Bible describes our day very clearly from these scriptures. The condition of wickedness and violence that caused the earth to be destroyed in Noah's day is the same condition our earth is in today. This is how people in Rwanda's western province start their day attempting to save whatever they can from their ruined homes. Muddy waters from Tuesday night's landslide still flow through Rubavu district, one of the hardest hit areas. Those who managed to escape the deluge described what they experienced. I was in bed. Suddenly my house moved and I thought it was the wind mixed with rain. Just as I was thinking what to do, the water was gone and the walls of my house were destroyed. I was saved by a neighbor and ran with my children. The rain was coming down heavily through the windows. I saw a neighbor house falling down and the old man living in it died. All of a sudden, the water and the river attacked us everywhere and the houses fell down one by one and we fled. Rescue crews are having a hard time getting to those most affected. Blocked main roads severely hampering rescue efforts. President Paul Kagame tweeted his condolences, saying his government will do everything within its means to assist. The governor of the Western Province, where most of the deaths are being reported, says his officials have prioritized reaching damaged houses to make sure no one is trapped. Those hoping for some relief from the downpours will have to wait. The Rwanda Meteorology Agency is warning more rain is to come. As the world continues to spin out of control, we can no longer afford to ignore the truth. Almighty God, the creator of heaven, earth, and all things is trying to get our attention. He is letting us know, through powerful weather catastrophes and the events happening in the world around us, that he is in control. And he is preparing to intervene in world affairs climaxing in the return of Jesus Christ. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear, that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world, as we know it, is near. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him, and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. Biblical repentance is changing your mind about Jesus Christ and turning to God in faith for salvation. Turning from sin is not the definition of repentance, but it is one of the results of genuine faith-based repentance towards the Lord Jesus Christ. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church, you may be at work, you 
you may be asleep, God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.